Dr. Craig will now have 12 minutes for his rebuttal. You'll remember that I began my opening speech by saying that we both face a burden of proof in tonight's debate. Uh, The resurrection fact or fiction? Now, Dr. Avalos in his last speech said that he will defend the position that there's not enough evidence to show that the resurrection is a fact. But notice that does not discharge his burden of proof to show that it is a fiction. There are many events, in fact, when you think about it, most events in history which you cannot prove to be historical, but that doesn't mean, therefore, they did not occur. Interestingly enough, Dr. Avalos recognizes this fact in his book, Se Puede Saber Si Dios Existe. He says, all of this doesn't mean that such an act didn't occur, merely that you cannot know that such a thing occurred based solely on the written accounts. But that's a position that's compatible with Christianity. As I say, most Christians don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus based on historical accounts. So just the fact that you couldn't prove the resurrection doesn't show it's a fiction. He's got to do more to establish uh, that it is fictional than he's done so far in tonight's debate. Now, first I said there are four facts which are accepted by the majority of scholars today who have studied the resurrection of Jesus. And Dr. Avalos response to this was remarkable. We actually got very few specifics. I didn't see any refutation in any of the several points that I raised. Instead, we got general comments like, well, these aren't facts. Rather, the story is a fact. But look, when I say these are facts, what I mean is that the story is factually accurate. And that is what the majority of New Testament scholars believe about the burial, the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and so forth, namely that these stories are true, and I gave arguments to show that they were factual in that way. That's the issue. Then Dr. Avalos remarkably says, but we don't have enough early manuscripts of the New Testament to attest its uh, accuracy. Now, what he seems to be suggesting here is that somehow these facts are called into question because of the textual corruption of the New Testament. But Dr. Avalos knows that the New Testament is the best attested book in ancient history, both in terms of the number of manuscripts and in terms of the nearness of those manuscripts to the date of original composition. We have over 5,000 manuscripts of the New Testament in Greek alone, and these come to within a gap of 100 to 150 years after the original. Compare that with the works of Plato, For the Dialogues of Plato, we have only seven manuscripts, and the gap between them and the original composition is 1,200 years. For the works of Aristotle, we have only five extant manuscripts separated by 1,000 years from the date of the composition. For the Annals of Tacitus in the first six chapters, there is one manuscript, and it is separated by 750 years from the original. Yet no scholar would doubt, seriously, the text of Plato, Aristotle, or Tacitus is being totally corrupted and worthless. In fact, the text of the New Testament that we have today that I I showed you before is over 99% accurate. Sir Frederick Kenyon, in his book Bible and Archaeology, has said that the last foundation for any doubt that the scriptures have come down to us substantially as they were written has now been removed. But secondly, I want to say about this, If Dr. Avalos were correct about this, it would undermine his own work on health care systems in the ancient Near East. You see, Dr. Avalos' sources for ancient health care systems are vastly inferior to the New Testament. Indeed, ironically, his primary source for er early Christian health care is the New Testament. Several critics in reviews of Dr. Avalos' work have noted this. For example, uh, David Martin in his review, he's from Yale University, says there are are problems with Avalos' choice of sources. For Christianity, he mainly limits himself remarkably to a reading of the canonical Gospels. These few texts are supposed to suffice to portray the Christian health care system. And Felix Just, in his review in the Catholic Biblical Quarterly, says that Avalos presents no direct evidence for his thesis except for the New Testament stories of Jesus himself healing people. 
So if Dr. Avalos says that the New Testament is so corrupted that we can no longer believe its historical credibility, he undermines his own work, which I don't think he would surely want to do. So the fact of the matter is that there are important issues about the resurrection, but friends, the textual purity of the New Testament is not one of them, honestly. You can be confident that the text of the New Testament, as you read it today, is substantially over 99% accurate, the text as it was originally written by Paul, John, Luke, or whomever. And that's just a fact. Now, what about Matthew 27? Is that historical or not? Approaching that as a historian rather than a Christian believer, I would have to say one doesn't know. I don't think you can prove that to be historical. And so I don't include that in my evidence. But I do think that these four facts that I've listed can be demonstrated historically. And with that conclusion, the minority of, the majority of New Testament scholars, whether Catholic, Protestant, Jewish, or secular, also agree. Well, apart from that, I saw no specific refutation of the burial, the empty tomb, the resurrection appearances, or the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. So we come to the question, what is the best explanation of this? I maintain that it is the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead. Now, Dr. Avalos responds, well, Dr. Craig is a naturalist when it comes to other religions, but not Christianity. Not at all. I'm willing to include any explanations in the pool of live options. I just maintain that when judged by those six criteria, the resurrection hypothesis is the best explanation. Now, Dr. Avalos then says, but a fact is only something that is verifiable by the five senses or by logic. His claim here is that the only statements which are rational to believe are either verifiable by the five senses, logically demonstrable, or implied by statements which are. This is a statement of classical foundationalism or evidentialism. This was popular back in the late 19th, early 20th century, but it's come on very hard times among epistemologists and philosophers in recent years. Two reasons for this. Number one, it's an overly restrictive definition of rationality or knowledge. If you adopt that theory of knowledge, we would have no mathematical knowledge because that's not verifiable by the five senses or deducible from logic, no ethical knowledge because moral values, right and wrong, cannot be demonstrated in that way, no aesthetic knowledge, the good cannot be verified by the five senses, neither can the beautiful. There would be no metaphysical knowledge. We would have no knowledge that there is really an external world rather than you be a brain in a vat being stimulated by a mad scientist with electrodes to think you're here in this hall hearing the lecture tonight. We would have no uh, rational beliefs about the past or the veridicality of our memory beliefs. We would have no knowledge that there are other minds because that cannot be verified by the five senses or demonstrated by logic. Finally, we would have no scientific knowledge, either because knowledge is per, or science is permeated with unprovable assumptions. So that what was realized is that this classical foundationalism leads to an unlivable skepticism. It would not only deny theological knowledge, but of the vast tracts of human knowledge we have today.